Right. Uh, welcome to Nitro, everybody. My name is Justin Durkin. I'm the Director of Engineering for the Nitro Pro product uh, here in Nitro. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the upcoming C++ standard. Uh, the particular part I'm, going to, I'm interested in is coroutines. Uh, before we, uh, we get into it, there's a few acknowledgements. Uh, these are various sources of information that I use to try and uh, come up with today's talk. Uh, I, these will be on the, the, in the slide deck for everybody to have a look at. I would very encourage everybody to have a, a look at these. These are very, very, uh, lots of information there. So, what are coroutines? Well, maybe they're new things to, to, to some people, maybe they're old hat to others, but basically they're very, very similar to subroutines. Uh, they can be called, they can be returned when they're completed. They're different from subroutines in that they can suspend themselves. They can be resumed by an external party usually. Uh, and if you look at them in a particular light, a subroutine is just a specialization of a coroutine. And if you look at the code flow, you can see a subroutine here on the left, coroutine on the right. You have a context switch from one thread of execution let me just rephrase that. You have a context switch from one flow into another flow. Uh, in the case of the subroutine, it is complete in and of itself. In the case of the coroutine, you suspend in the middle, you go back as many times as you like to resume from that suspend point. Why are coroutines useful? Well, one of the great things about coroutines is that they're very much driven by events. Event-driven architectures that are natural fit. You've got games, services, simulations, user interfaces. Another place where they're very useful is for cooperative multitasking. They're very, very good for that because they have extremely low context switch overhead. It basically boils down to a function call. Tasks, uh, they use as much time as they need. They don't have to use a time slot. It's literally when I'm done, I'm out of there and the next co-routine or back to the main uh, uh, calling routine. So first thing we're gonna have a look at is a non-optimized regular function call. And this is the compiler explorer. Most of you will be familiar with it. And here we have a main function that calls into a function that squares its input. I've taken uh, a couple of local variables just to show how they're constructed onto a stack frame. We have here on the left, uh, sorry, on the left we have the, the code, in the middle we have the assembly language, and here we have the shape of the stack. Now we're starting our call here at the push, that is the entry point in main. First thing we do is we push that base pointer onto the stack. This represents at least one CPU register, but there could be many more, depending on the individual function calls. We then move, sorry, the little uh, orange marker is the instruction before it is just completed. So we've now moved the base pointer to where the stack pointer currently is. So they're now both pointed the same place. We subtract 16 bytes from that uh, stack pointer and this gives us a partial stack frame within which all the details of the next function call can be stored. We push in a temporary variable, this is our input val. We, uh, what did I do there? Yeah, we move it into an EDI register which is what we use for this calling convention. We're now ready to call our function. First thing we do, that, and that's, this causes the return address to be pushed onto the stack. This is how the function that we call gets back to us. A lot of you are gonna be very familiar with this, but just to complete the picture. And here we go through the same thing again, pushing the base pointer to the stack. We now have saved it. We move our uh, base pointer down to the uh, position of the stack pointer. We pull out from EDI our temporary, this is our parameter, and we move it there into the temporary. We now do the multiply, none of this affects the stack. And here's our return value being pushed onto the stack. Now in this case, it doesn't matter because it's a simple function, but if you had a more complex function where registers weren't enough to return that value, you would need to have some temporary stack space for that return value. In this case, it's slightly redundant. Uh, I didn't want to have lots of assembly language to be going through. So it just pushes it into a temp and then pulls it back out. We pop our base pointer back. So now we're back into the 
ready to, to return to our previous function. When we do a return, we pull the return address off. We're now back at our original point after the call. We clear out the register, don't worry about that. Uh, we have a little bit of temporary, which is where the result is stored here. And we're now back to where we were. We're ready to come out and everything is rippling back up. So what we have here is what's called a stack frame. And every function call has a stack frame. You go into a function, you create a stack frame. From that function, you go into another one, you push another stack frame onto the stack. And this is how the context is remembered between the caller and the callee. So this is, this is what goes into the typical stack frame. You can see saved CPU registers, the local variables, some temporaries if they're needed, parameters if they're large and can't be passed in registers, and a return address. Where you have multiple functions nested in one another, you have multiple stack frames stacked up. And this is how the context is remembered and unrolled as we go along. So in the context of coroutines, this whole relationship with the stack is vital. There are two basic different types of coroutines. The stackful coroutine, which has its own stack, and the stackless coroutine, which uses the caller's stack. So we'll start with the stackful coroutines, and these are sometimes called things like fibers or green threads or lightweight threads, go routines, they're all much as much. Um, they all have their own stack. They have an independent lifetime, you can attach them to a thread, detach them from a thread, put them onto another thread, no big deal. It's still cooperative multitasking. The individual fibers decide when to contact switch and when to not. Uh, they can go to other fibers or back to the caller. Because they have their own stack, they can all be implemented in a library. There's no need for language support in order to be able to do it. And a typical example of that is the Boost Fibers Library. I believe there's a proposal to standardize a similar type of library for uh, C++ 23. STD fiber context, I think it's called. Um, it might have been, if anybody was looking at the, uh, the Belfast standards meeting, the trip reports from that, you might hear that being mentioned. Um, stackless coroutines, on the other hand, they use the caller stack. One consequence of that is that they can only be suspended from the top level. Now what that means is when you call into the coroutine, any functions that it calls must fully return before you get to your suspension point because at the suspension point, you gotta get back to the caller in order to get a stack. Uh, so the coroutine state therefore cannot be saved on the stack, it must be saved elsewhere and typically that is the heap. There is an optimization that can happen that can undo all of that and you, you basically end up with what are equivalent entirely to functions. Um, because coroutine and a function are essentially the same thing from the code point of view, the compiler has to step in and you need language support in order to be able to use and create coroutines. So that's what you have in C++20, uh, stackless coroutines, they have a great value over stack full coroutines in that they're generally much more lightweight and hence much more efficient. So we'll have a look at how a stack full coroutine would work. So step one here, we're at a function call in the stack frame, we create a fiber. So this object here is created. Uh, when it's created, it's activation frame, which is the analog in coroutines of the stack frame. Not quite, but similar. Um, in the fiber context, we have its own stack. So we create all of this when the create happens. Then some time later, possibly in another function call, we call into the coroutine. We start it. So it starts running through its own stack context at this point. Some point, maybe in a function call, it will suspend. When it has suspended, we go back to our original caller or possibly to another fiber. Sometime later, we have an, a, another function call. It could be the same level of the function stack, it could be lower. We resume. This means we change context back into this coroutine uh, 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 context. So we're back here now. We can call again, and at this point, we're finished. So we ripple back up and we return back to the caller. At that point, the coroutine is done. 
It cannot be resumed after it returns. That's one of the, the, the conditions of a coroutine. But because it had its own stack, because the caller had its own stack, they've acted entirely independently. Right, so this is the, basically in words, what that diagram had in imagery. And uh, I won't repeat myself, but basically that's what it is. This is a boost fiber example. So here we have a fiber that has created. It, it's a coroutine that uses the, this Fn function. So this Fn function runs as a coroutine. When the fiber is created, it also starts this function. First thing it does is it yield, is it goes through a loop and within the loop it prints out something and it yields. Yield in this context for the fiber means give up my state and return to another fiber or back to the caller. Back here in the caller, where we've we got it, we've created it, we print out its ID and we join. This basically means let the fiber run to completion. So basically all the yields now will not come back to the caller. They will instead go to any other fibers that are in context and give them a chance to run. In the case of, in this example, there is no other fiber, so it does nothing. It basically completes the loop and exits and comes back to the joint. Those of you who are familiar with boost threads or anything like that, or STD threads, there's, a, there's quite a lot of, uh, to be compared here, they're not, they're not that different. Um, these are a bit lighter weight, that's all. Now, stackless coroutines, on the other hand, they have, they use the caller stack. They don't have their own stack. The, their activation frame, it must exist on the heap, therefore, as a result. Because they don't have their own stack, they don't have to manage their own stack, they're lighter weight, they're a lot more efficient. They do require language support so that, you know, your code can tell that this is a coroutine. Uh, the stack does double duty, needs help to decide if it needs to be working to support subroutine action or coroutine action. So once the coroutine has started, this is the most important point, all function calls made by the coroutine must return before that coroutine suspends. This is so that the stack is available, as it was when we created the core routine. And this is a, a flow through. So we start up at the top here, we create a core routine. This frame is now created on the heap. Some function call later maybe, we start the core routine. Now at this point, the context is here, we don't have a stack. If we wanna make a call, we gotta go back to the caller's stack and save our state there. We have to finish that call. We must get back here before we suspend. When we suspend, we come back to the point where we were called. This is why that stack frame must be the current stack frame. We can now make another function call over, beg your pardon, over here. This will resume our coroutine. Now we can do another function call. Again, we must return to this context. So the stack must be back at the same state it was here. So this function call must return. Then we can complete our coroutine and we're done. This is, again, in words, happens. Won't go through it again. So C++ 20 coroutines, these are stackless. This is the key feature. This gives them kind of a bit less and a bit more than is provided in other languages. JavaScript, Python, C Sharp, et cetera. They come with a lot of support for coroutines and resumables and generators and all kinds of things like that. The thing about C++20, it's scaffolding. You do not get the high level objects. It's like pointers. What can you do with a pointer? Well, you can do anything with a pointer, but it's just a number in the end of the day that they reference into something else. So that something else is where the meat is. We don't have that something else in C++20. It is expected in C++23 um, to be standardized. More of that as we go along. What about C++, what, what makes a coroutine in C++? A, a function becomes a coroutine if it's got any of these three keywords in it. They're present, this is where the compiler comes in and says I need language support. 
co-return, co-yield, co-await. If those keywords are in there at all, you have a co-routine. And now you have some obligations. So this is an example of use of a co-routine. Now, it's kind of a bad example. And remember I said these various other uh, uh, links that I provided an acknowledgement at the start, this, this is from them. So the future that we have here is not STID future. It's STID experimental future. So forgive me for, for, for missing on this uh, earlier on. What we have here is an, an async call that returns 42. This is the regular async call. It returns a future that returns an in, that gives you back an in. This is a coroutine. Here we have co-await. Same async, but when the then continuation can be called in the std async, it will resume this. So this basically suspends waiting for this async to return. And when it does, it now returns using the co-return the result. Notice this is an int, but this is the future. Over here, we have an int, but the stood async returns a future. So there's a wrapper going on in here, and here there isn't. All right, more into the coroutine frame now. So the function called frame, as you can see, we've got CPU registers, local variables, temporaries, parameters, and the return address, the most important thing. Coroutine frame has the same CPU registers, local variables, temporaries, parameters, just like the other case, but here is the suspension point address. This is the analogous, this is analogous to the return address. We also have this thing, the promise object. The promise object is how your caller and your coroutine communicate with each other. So when you do something in the coroutine, you suspend. How do you resume? You need something that you can say to the coroutine, here, resume yourself. And how do I get the result back? The promise object is the way you do that. There's also defined in the standard various room here for compiler specifics. And like I said, all of that there is heap allocated. Now here we have this object called the coroutine handle. This is the interface to this coroutine frame. And this is the one thing that you will play with a lot when you're doing coroutines. Now remember I said that it's scaffolding. Well, we're going to talk a little bit now about the scaffolding. What does co-await do? Well, this is a typical use of co-await. You have a, an auto result, you co-await on an expression. This expression is this very special type of expression because it's an awaitable expression. It's not just any expression. It has, beg your pardon, it has defined behaviors. So what are these defined behaviors? Well, this is what it really, really does internally. So this expression, or statement other, is translated into this code internally. Now, you won't ever see this code necessarily, but this is what that here becomes. So we have an expression, we, we have an alias basic or a reference to it here. It must have this await ready behavior. And all, must also have this await suspend and this await resume. And what we ask here is, are you ready? Is your work done? Or do you need to suspend? If it says it's not ready, then we suspend by calling suspend. We give it a handle to our coroutine in the, in the, on the heap. Right now, the program has stopped. Or rather, this, this, this coroutine has stopped. We now are back in the context of our caller. When we come back and we are resumed, we eventually fall out here and we call this. So, awaitable expressions, they need to fill, fulfill the awaitable concept. And any object that supports all three of these is defined as awaitable. We can use it with co-await. Can anybody think of a very trivial example of what you would do with an awaitable expression. Remember, it's going to suspend or it's not. So, and the typically uh, trivial example is to suspend always. This will never come back unless you push it. 
So what we have here is a wait ready. I am never ready. So I will always suspend. And uh, a wait suspend does nothing. A wait resume does nothing. This is a trivial suspender. And uh, they're used all over the place in as the fundamental little unit of coroutine action. Uh, it has a complement called suspend never, which says I'm always ready. I'll do nothing. There will be no suspension. I just barrel straight through. So these are very useful little kind of almost like fundamental particles of coroutines in our scaffolding. All of these use a handle to a coroutine. So what is the behaviors of this coroutine handle? Well, the first thing is that it's an object that manages the state within the coroutine frame. The coroutine frame itself is not generally exposed, but this coroutine handle is an interface into it. So we have the ability to construct it, to check it for validity, to do a completion, are you done? Uh, to resume, to interface with C functions by, that take a void star as a context. Uh, you can obviously destruct them, retrieve the promise, and find the coroutine handle given the promise. So you basically end up with code that looks like this. So here we have the definition. We've got the constructors and the assignment operator. We've got the check for, valid for validity. We have the check for done down here. We have a from an address, void star. We can get back the coroutine handle. This is a static function. From the coroutine handle, we can get an address for it. That we can, so this provides us with a context object that we can pass into those C level functions that take void star as a context. Um, we have the operator here that invokes the coroutine. We have a resume method and a destroy method. Now this coroutine handle is for a coroutine that returns nothing. There's a special, and this is a, a, a template specialization. Here we have the coroutine that takes a promise. So we have a defined result that we're expecting and it um, derives from this one. Here we have access to the promise and given the promise, we can get the coroutine handle from that promise. It's like a lookup table. Quick recap, coroutine frame is heap allocated when the coroutine starts. When suspended, the coroutine frame contains the state to restore when the coroutine later resumes. This includes, most importantly, the location of the suspension point. A handle of this coroutine frame is returned to the caller of the coroutine. When resumed, the state is restored from that coroutine frame, and this is followed by a jump to the suspension point. Here we have an example. And if any of you want to use Clang 9, you can actually use these little snippets. So here we have a coroutine called foo, returns nothing, prints out hello, suspends always, then it prints out world. What will happen if I, I try to use this? What do we expect to happen? Ends up who thinks it'll suspend. Won't compile. <laughs> you can't you run it at all. We don't have a promise. Remember I talked about the promise? Here we have a coroutine that we can never resume. There's no communications channel between the coroutine and its caller. So what we need to do, we need to do a little bit more work. And this is where C++ 20 coroutines, are, they really you know, reveal themselves to be just scaffolding. So specifically, how do we talk to the coroutine from the outside? Specifically, how do we resume it? So, Let's just imagine that we're trying to create a little bit of infrastructure here. So we're going to create a class called resumable. It's going to have a method called resume. An instance of this class will be returned by the function when it suspends and when it returns normally. So this is what we're going to end up with. We have a resumable that is returned. This is our normal return. We have a co-await and there's no way to get back here. So how do we get our resumable back here so that we can resume it? Remember, our return has not happened. This is compiler magic. Right? 
And this is basically what the, stand, the standard has defined as how coroutines will operate. Let's have a look at some of that compiler magic. When you create a coroutine, there's a little bit of code generated. We have our promise type created, and that it will be a member of our coroutine frame typically. This code here is generated for you. This code here is also generated from you. So, and in, in between here, your coroutine body of its code is injected. So the first thing we do is we have a, an awaitable initial suspend call. This is part of our promise. So there is an initial suspend method in our promise. Likewise, if, our, if we have an unhandled exception within our coroutine, it's caught here. Again, this only happens if the exceptions are enabled. But the promise has an unhandled exception method. We have a final suspend label down here and another awaitable expression that calls final suspend. And these are opportunities for you in writing your, your infrastructure to control the minute details of the flow through your coroutine. So let's create our own promise type here around this resumable. So we define a type called promise type. And here is its elaboration. So the first thing we have is a way to get back this object that we want, resumable. Now I'm just gonna go back here. I didn't mention this comment here. Create resumable using a call to promise get return object. This is injected, this call is injected by the compiler and it provides you a means to get at the resumable object through the body of your coroutine. Remember, we have not returned here. We do not have a, a resumable to give back, so this has to be created for us. Okay. So this function does that. Here's our initial suspend. We can do what we think is appropriate here. We have a final suspend. Again, we can do what's appropriate here. Return void and unhandled exception. Now, return void standard mandates that you must create this method. You cannot simply return nothing because returning isn't simply giving back a value. You now have the infrastructure to unwind. So if you want to return nothing, you must do it by an explicit call to this method. And in this body, body of this method, you have the opportunity to do a little bit more minute detail if you wish to do it. Promise type to the control, how we tie the two together is typically through the constructor. So the resumable gets there. And here we have, we get rid of the uh, uh, copy and move uh, constructors. We have a resume here. If the handle is done, if it's not done, we resume. So if we're not finished, we can resume. Or if we are, well, whether we're finished or not, we return the value of the done to our caller. When we, when we are destroyed ourselves, we destroy the handle to the coroutine. Here's our coroutine handle. This interfaces to our, remember our activation frame. Told you there's a lot of scaffolding <laughs> that we have to fill in the details for. So uh, here we have our getter return object. So from the promise, this is this object, we return the coroutine handle. This is how we return this resumable that we've created so that we can use it for resuming, for uh, communication and so on. Our initial suspend, we just use suspend always. So that basically means that when our coroutine starts, it will start in a suspended state, which is very often exactly what you want to do. You don't necessarily want it to do anything until you tell it, go resume yourself, now do something. So this is not an uncommon thing to do. Likewise, final suspend, we say suspend always. When we are finished our coroutine, we might want to leave it hanging around a bit so we can get information out of it before it is finally destroyed. So we will say suspend always as the final suspend. Return void, we do nothing, and we terminate if we get an unhandled exception. This is our example. In your own code, if you're doing anything with coroutines, you'll do whatever you think is appropriate. And this is how we would use it typically. So as long as our resume returns true, we're not ready, we will continue to resume and give the coroutine a chance to run. This is how we have communicated from the outside to a coroutine on the inside. 
But remember that final suspend. It's a label. You all love go-tos, don't you? So what is this label doing here? Why do we have this label? Well, when the compiler sees co-return, it doesn't just return. It's got a little bit of stuff to do, right? Now, if the co-return is the last statement in your function, then this label is redundant. But if it's not, we've got work to do before we finish, before we actually leave. So we got to do this return void bit and, excuse me, and we then jump to our final suspend. Now, if I see this code in anybody's function, I'm going to be giving them a bad review, but it's okay for the compiler to do it. All right? Uh, okay, so, so far we've talked about coroutines that return void. Coroutines that return a value, you would typically see coreturn x. Our promise type now needs to have a value member to carry that result, and we also need to change return void to return value. And I have this instead highlighted here because you cannot have both. And later on, we'll show a third option. So one of those three must be used, but not all. You can, if you do include them, you're into undefined behavior territory. Um, so don't do it. Right. So this is a resumable that returns a value. Basically, it's the same thing as we had before. Right? This time, we're going to keep a result somewhere in our promise. And when we do the return value, we're just going to return it. It's nothing special. Here in our resume, but we're going to have a return value call that gets it. And all we're going to do is get the promise and get the result field from the promise. Very, very straightforward. And here, if we want to use it, in this case, we have a resumable that suspends hello world. So we will create a resumable here. We will resume it and resume it and resume it, resume it and get the return value here. So hello world will appear and the return value, sorry, hello will appear, the return value world, and then we'll print that out here. Before I go on, any uh, questions? All right, okay. The other keyword that we mentioned was co-yield. Now, co-yield, this is, this is like a very useful keyword for doing things like generators. The generator is an object that generates the next element in a potentially infinite data stream. Those of you who are familiar with input iterators, it's not that dissimilar. It is inherently lazy. What happens when we call it? The coroutine promise object is set. The coroutine is immediately suspended. The caller gets the value from the promise object. The caller then resumes the coroutine to get another value. So it's a jump, 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 jump. That's the way the co-yield co works. And here's an example of a yielding promise type. And here's this other function that you must use instead of return value or return void. It's yield value. And typically what you have is you set a result just like in the co-return, but you suspend always just after you do the return. So now your yield function sets up a return in the promise or sets up a value in the promise and suspends. And this happens every time. Uh, and again, we access it from a resumable with this simple method call. And here we have a very simple use of yield. We create a resumable. While we resume it, we output the yield value. And here, while true, we yield an incrementing number. This is an infinite, lazily generated data stream of integers. This will never end. It'll even overflow and keep going. Generator, very useful concept. It's a higher level concept. Uh, the requirements of it, it in, in our case, we're going to write a generator here is that it be generic, parameterized by the type to be generated. It's a coroutine type that generates a potentially infinite lazy sequence. It has iterator semantics usable within a ranged for loop. Those are the requirements that we're going to try and create when we create this generator. This is building on top of the scaffold and creating our own higher level object. Before we go into it, let's have a look at how coroutines and range-based fars will coexist. So this is the line from the standard. We can have far with co-await optional, a range declaration, a range initializer, and then some statements. 
This is equivalent to all of this. And see, coa weight in here, coa weight in here. Right? So every iteration around the loop, we have this coa weight if we choose to use it. But we, basically, it's an, awaitable, an, uh, an opportunity to put in an awaitable expression. Can you see that down the back? All right. Well, God bless your eyes. Uh, so this is a generator object. All right. Now here we have a um, promise type, a alias for the, the coroutine handle with our promise type, and this iterator. We're going to write that as well, so we'll, we'll get back to that. We have this object, this method that will return the current value of the generator. And this will go to the promise and get the value from the promise. We have this move next method that will resume and will return are we done? Because our generator doesn't have to be infinite, it can have a limit. Um, we have an iterator begin, an iterator end, and these will return an iterator object that is constructed here with a false if it's begin and with a true if it's an end. Now, the reason we do that is because we have no idea what sequence we're going to be iterating over. We just know that the coroutine is going to handle it and it's going to tell us when it's done. So it's going to be done if it's reached the end by returning true and false if it's not done. So here we have a copy constructor which we're getting rid of and here we have the move constructor which is just the usual move semantics. Our destructor will destroy the coroutine if it exists. Our generator, this is a private constructor that takes the handle type, and there's the coroutine handle itself. Now, this is our promise type for this. Again, we've got our generator and we've got a template that uh, 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 defines that. Here's the value that we're going to return. Promise type constructor, here's the initial value, the destructor. Initial suspend, suspend always, because we don't want to run this to run until we tell it to. Final suspend, suspend always, because we want to be able to get at its value when it finally suspends. We don't want it to disappear. To get return object, again, the same as before, we create uh, uh, from the promise, uh, 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 created the generator from the promise. Return void does nothing, yield value, returns or gives us back the value, sorry, sets the value and suspends. You, you're right and you found my mistake. Deliberate mistake, by the way, just to see if you're all awake. Well done. <laughs> right, so we have our iterator now. This advanced method will resume. Check are we done by checking the coroutine, is it done? Uh, the not equal to will check the done conditions in the inverse sense. The plus will call advance, return it. The accessor will get the promise value. Again, this is all straightforward stuff. The iterator will take the generator object and this bool flag that are we done. Set the various things accordingly. For not done, it will advance. And there's the private members. And here is how we will use it for auto v gen ints 10. Gen ints returns a generator of ints, takes a limit. For one to the limit, it yields the number. And here we output the number and we're done. Lovely, nice little compact bit of code that does this interaction back and forward. And if I didn't give it a limit, if I wrote this version that didn't have a limit, this would be a lazily generated infinite sequence. And in this case, it's a lazily generated finite sequence. Beauty about these is that they're dirt easy to compose. This is not that easy to do without coroutines. So here we have a generator that generates ints to a limit, and here we have a generator that generates cars from A to Z. It yields a car, from one to a limit, it yields the, the I. Here's a generator that takes a pair, generates a pair from the int, from the car, combines them in for loops, yields the pair. For, this is a structured assignment, we get the pair back, and we output each of them. Try and do that with loose um, for loops. Not that easy, it's quite tricky. These compose very easily. 
this is the one question I asked myself when I started this. It's all a bit complicated. Why do we, why do we bother? Well, well, one of the things about coroutines that makes them very, very valuable is that they are really highly scalable. They're so lightweight that it's really easy to have billions of these if you chose to do so. And that's a level of concurrency that's just really hard to do any other way. There's a very efficient suspend and resume overhead. It's really kind of not that far from a regular function call. The seamless interaction with existing facilities without any additional overhead. In the end of the day, it is just a function call or it is just a regular object. It's an open-ended machinery, which is useful. Library designers can create higher level objects just like our generator earlier on. And whether you have exceptions enabled or not, it's not really germane. You can have coroutines that are fully exception aware and those that are not. Um, and like I said earlier on, they're very easy to compose. There are a couple of gotchas though. This is an interesting one. See this, uh, this, this function here. We have a generator of cars that takes a, a, a constant string reference S and yields each character in the string. Fairly straightforward, not that different from our earlier coroutine. And here we call this, this will not do well, that string there. And we output the character. It doesn't look that problematic, does it? It looks fairly innocent. This is a reference. But you see, this is a literal, and it's going to create a temporary. And this yield means that there's a routine, a function that's going to exit many times. And after the first exit, the temporary is gone. So this is a dangling reference that's going to leave you in trouble. And the golden rule is call by ref don't call by reference, call by value. So, sorry, did I jump too far? Oh, I thought I had a, a, a thing there. Anyway, the summary so far, C++ 20 coroutines, they're low level. You don't pay what you don't use. That's the motto. Uh, they're not inherently that easy. So you do need to kind of invest some time in learning about them uh, at the moment. They're, they are quite powerful. I would recommend that they be used for anybody as a kind of a first thing to think about when you want to do concordancy. If it's, if it's amenable to, to cooperative uh, uh, multitasking, then for sure consider it. Um, we do really, really need some higher level helper classes. Uh, the generator is great and all of that. It's fairly easy to understand, but there is there's higher level things that we really need to make this work really seamlessly. C++23 is expected to standardize some of these, but um, you know we've been looking for future for a long time and it hasn't really come yet. Um, and like I said earlier there, you need to be careful with temporaries uh, and references to temporaries. And uh, the general recommendation is that you always use call by value semantics. At the higher level, well, there are places that are already writing these things. They're not standardized, so they are worth a look, and I would highly recommend this guy's website, Lewis Baker. He's one of the people I reference at the start in the acknowledgements. Uh, he's got a library called CPP Coroutine, which has got a bunch of these higher level objects. And here are just some of the ones from it. Task T is a task that is not executed until it's awaited. It can be very useful. The generator. Not unlike our own generator, except maybe a little richer. Uh, we have an I/O service that uh, handles I/O completion events. File, readable file, writable file, provides cancelable read and write. Oh, cancelable read and write. That's brilliant. Uh, schedule on can specify that a coroutine starts in a given thread, and resume on can say that it be resumed from a given thread. So the final words on coroutines in C++ 20, they're stackless, very, very efficient, may not suit everybody. They may be suspended only from the top level and this can be a constraint. All functions used by the coroutine prior to its suspend point must return. Again, you know, it might work for you, it may not. Um, no coroutine can be suspended by another function or coroutine. It can only be suspended by itself. Now, you know, if that works, that's great. But, you know, sometimes you don't, you'd like things to be a little bit more um, symmetric. 
Um, coroutine cannot delegate its work to another coroutine. Its workflow must go back to its caller. And this is, this is all about the fact that it doesn't have its own stack. So it cannot remember where it is. It must go back to the caller and the caller now controls everything. Despite that, they're first class. So they can be passed around just like data. They can use as arguments or as return values. And if you are familiar with callables in C++, they're very, very analogous. Um, and like I said earlier on, standardized higher level abstractions would be really, really helpful. That's C++ coroutines and a little exploration. Now, I've dug into it quite a bit, but I didn't write the standards. So if you have any questions, I may say pass. Any questions? Yes. So the question was, is there any way to, to dictate where the coroutine allocation frame uh, uh, is allocated from? Yes, there is. There is a, the equivalent of placement new. There is a, uh, the equivalent of its own dedicated allocators that you can define. With, these are in the standard. That's, let's call that an advanced function. Right? <laughs> I didn't dig into that. Uh, I can, the question is, can it be moved uh, once allocated? Um, don't know, I would imagine yes, because it is a Well, like anything in C++, you can bend the rules. And if you bend the rules, it's all on you. In that case, you haven't been careful enough. You can do exactly the same thing with a struct. Right? If you do that with a struct, you're going to end up in trouble. So, yes, you can, but you need to be careful, right? Just like anything else. Can it, sorry, the question was again? Because, sorry, the question is, why can it not delegate its work to another coroutine? So, right, this is me guessing here. Um, when you have a coroutine, you have this allocation, this, 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 this activation frame on the heap. At that point, it has been called by something on a calling thread, right? If you want to delegate its actions to a, something else, you're going to have to move from the calling thread where the coroutine handle lives or rather the, 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 the communications with that coroutine handle lives somewhere else. So that connection isn't defined, right? So you can call, you must return. If you call and suspend, which is what you want to do, now you've got this activation frame that you can't get at anymore. Caller has the access to the caller coroutine handle. This is the resumable that you return back that you can use to do your call. So there is no second level in there, but you're stuck, right? Now, before you suspend, remember, you're free to make calls because you own the stack at that point. So at that point, you can create new coroutines, but they must complete before you suspend yourself. Now, big, big caveat around that, that's a guess. <laughs> All right, but you know, Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so the question was, uh, the static analysis tools, do they play well with coroutines? I have no idea. Um, I would imagine that there might be some challenges because things ain't quite the same as they are, as they were when the, the static analyzer tools are written, but it's only a catch up game. Little arms race is probably developing and they'll sort themselves out very shortly. That's my, again, another guess. Yes. It's not a function. Yeah. The, don't believe so. There must be one of the return void, return value, or yield value. 
I don't believe you can have multiples. So if you want to return something that has got polymorphism, then you need a base class and you have to return that, I think. Again, it's a guess. Thank you, pardon. So the question there was, uh, can your yield, um, your yield value function be overloaded? And I don't believe it can. Um, I think what you need to do there is if you want to return something that's polymorphic, you need to return a um, base class or something like that. But again, that's a guess. I would encourage you to have a look at the standard. I know it's horrible reading, but give it a go anyway. Right. Can you you are delegating a call from a routine to a subroutine. The question that we ask is like, without suspending, can you delegate the call or? Up until the point that the core routine, sorry, can you delegate, the question is, can you delegate from the call to some other call before your core routine suspends? Yeah. Can you call another subroutine within the, 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 the start of your core routine? Absolutely. There's no problem with that. It's, you see, the, what happens is control of the stack transfers to the coroutine and it remains just like any other function call until the suspension point is reached. At that point, all bets are off. You need to get back to the level of the stack that your caller just made. So when you entered your coroutine at the top, that's the level of stack you have to be at when you suspend. So any functions that you have called, regular subroutines, must have returned. When they return, you're now at the same level, now you can suspend. And that's because you need to have the same core, the same stack frame active at that point. Yeah? All right. This is defined again by the standard. So again, I encourage people to have a bit of a deep dive into that if they're really interested. It's like I said, hard reading, but you know, we all have our penance to do. Any other questions? All right, thank you everybody for, for joining us tonight. If anybody wants to have a chat afterwards, I'll hang around for a little while. Thank you very much for coming.